Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we're wise enough not to come to hear from a man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts this night. Build us, edify us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us and guard us to be all that Jesus paid for on that cross. And God will give you the praise. Now, Lord, all the churches that are meeting in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel, they're our brothers and our sisters, and we love them and ask you to bless them. And God will give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say amen. I want to tell you a little story that was brought to my attention by the Holy Spirit a couple of weeks ago, Deborah and I, in one of our mornings, we're talking about it. Some time back, I was in a group of people and talking, and it came out that I was a pastor. These people didn't know me. And uh, I don't always like that when people find out I'm a pastor because immediately the conversation changes and the people start acting different. And so I just kind of like to be Jim, you know, but it, it came out. And I remember this person who was, I thought was, a much uh, older person than myself started making some statements about her relationship with God. Statements like uh, negative and critical and bitter. I could tell that she was an unhappy person. I could tell by the way she looked that life had been very difficult, if at the least, for her. She had had a lot of situations. She started to explain how difficult life was, and I was listening. She also finished the conversation with, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus. And of course, my answer in response to her was, well, that's good, you're going to go to heaven. And I was happy just to kind of get away because there wasn't anything I could do about it for her other than to listen to her complain. I found out later on she was much younger than me, and yet she looked because life was so hard she looked much older, was much more in a difficult position physically and spiritually, and I, I, it troubled me. As a pastor, I care about the condition of the people of God. There's no way you're going to do this job and not care about the condition of the people. I cared enough to often think over and over again about how the person that I was talking to was so weary in life and had such a difficult life. It was almost as if it was unfair, but the Spirit of God spoke to me and said it was very fair. For the longest time, I could never figure out exactly what it was that makes the difference between some people who call themselves Christians successful and other people that call themselves Christians totally and completely not successful, frustrated, defeated, never having that fresh anointing, never getting that one touch from God that takes them over, seem to always be in a battle, seem to always be in a fight. And then there's some that come along and don't seem to hardly do anything, and yet they're blessed in every area. What in the world is the difference? What is it that I could easily define so that someone could see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears that would change them so that they can be the one that God wants them to be, blessed in every area. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. A lot of people that go to church don't believe that God wants to bless them. It's hard for me to imagine. The only thing I can say about that is they must not read their Bible. Because you'll find it all through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, God's desire for each and every one of us in here is to bless you in every area. In fact, Jesus even makes this statement, if you will, in John the 10th chapter, he says, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. 
You don't have to worry about some people try to translate that verse as if when you get to heaven, you're going to have life. And when you get to heaven, you're going to have abundance. Can I tell you something? When you get to heaven, you don't have to worry about abundance nor life. He's not talking about that. He's talking about right now the condition of the people. God cared about the condition of the people as they came out of Egypt from bondage and bring them into the promised land. God cared about the condition of Israel. God cared about the condition of the people under the administration of Elijah and Elisha. God cared about the administration of the people and whether they're blessed in every realm. God wanted to take care of every single. Why is it that some people are blessed and others that call themselves Christians are not blessed. Well, I don't know where you're at tonight, but that's a good question. Some of you can look at your life and say, you need a touch from God. You need some favor from God. God needs to go before you and open up some doors that no man can open up and close some doors that no man can close. God needs to do that for your life tonight because you yourself are even frustrated that you're not getting out of life what you think possibly you could have or that you at least want. I'm here to tell you something unusual tonight. God wants to bless you. The word blessing means that it gives you the power to get prosperity in every area of your life. I'm not talking about money just in your pocket. I'm talking about every area. Prosperity is when your family works good together. Prosperity is when you're in health. Prosperity is when you're excited about the next day and have hope for tomorrow and see the results of your work yesterday. Prosperity is when you know you're living life to the fullest because God has gone before you and designed where you're going and you have to be right on track with him. Prosperity is a whole lot more than the amount of money that you have in your checking account or whether or not you've got a great balance in your savings account. Prosperity is the abundance that Jesus paid for, for every single one of us. Why is it then that some of you that are sitting in here tonight don't live that kind of a life? Why is it that you are just getting by? Why is it that you are barely making it? You're, some of you that are in here tonight are just holding on. How come? What's going on? And then why is it that others that show no effort at all are hardly holding on at all, but yet they're blessed in every area? The Word of God makes it very clear. How is it that that woman that I talked to was so discouraged and so defeated and calls herself a Christian? Maybe she is a Christian, I don't know. But how come she was failing in life and only had one thing to look forward to and that was heaven because life on earth had been ruined. But do you know one touch from God take you to a new place, a new abundance and new blessings. One touch from God, one favor of God on your life can change everything in your life. And you and I have got to get to the place where realizing that what God wants is what we ought to want. If God wants to bless you and take you to a higher level and a closer relationship with him and the blessings of the Lord, then you need to do what you need to do to get into the right place to get there and get those blessings. You don't need to sit back and make excuses. There's a lot of churches that you can go to and make excuses about where you're at. A lot of people will come and get on board with your pity party. In fact, may I say there's more people that will get on board with your pity party than will stop and correct you when you need to be corrected. This is not about who's on the pity party. It's about who can do the things that are right before the Lord in order to get yourself in a position that God wants you in in order to be developed in such a way that God can trust you with the blessings that he has for you and the future he has for you. I was reading not too long ago in the scripture when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and those that were following him. And he made a comment. It's a simple thing. And I want to read it to you tonight, and I want to discuss it with you a little bit. But as he makes this comment, he makes a comment that is, if you will, the basics of everything. If you don't understand this, is what he says to his disciples. Listen to this. You won't understand anything. That's a pretty basic statement. If you don't get this, you're not going to get the rest. And could it be that there's a lot of people that just... Don't get it. Could it be you that are sitting here tonight and you just aren't 
getting it. And I'm here to share, share this with you. I don't want to put any condemnation or anything like that on anybody. I love you too much, but I, I want to jerk some slack out of the, where you're at and get you to the place where you need to be because there's nothing better than to see you happy and fulfilled and blessed. And that's what I'm interested in tonight. If you'll go with me to Mark in the fourth chapter, Jesus starts to talk to his disciples and those that were following him. So he's not only got his 12 disciples, but others also. In verse number three, he makes this statement. Listen, you know when Jesus says listen, behold, you know what the words listen, behold means? It means listen and look and see. I've got something important to say to you. I don't know about you, but when I see that in the scripture, that ought to get my attention right off the bat. That's like a big red flag going up. Here's Jesus making a statement to these guys, and the statement that he's making has been recorded and preserved for thousands of years just for you. At the cost of people's lives, the blood is poured so that the word of God could be in your lap right now and find it in your heart so that you can do and live a prosperous and successful life. And here's Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one whom we celebrate this entire month of December. This Jesus makes a statement. He says, listen and behold, a sower went out to sow. And I'm going to read verse number four, and I'm going to come back. We'll talk about this in a moment, but let's take a look at it. And it happened as he sowed that some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, verse number five, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it scorched and became, uh, and, and because it had no root, it withered away. And verse number seven, it says, and some seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, producing some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And he said to them these words, listen to this out of verse number 9, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, it sounds like something simple to understand, but it was not simple to understand. The disciples didn't get it, neither did the people that were following Jesus get it. But he makes this statement, if you've got ears to hear, my goodness, hear what I just said. Listen and behold. And he goes on from there, and notice what it says in verse number 10. But when they were all was alone, those around him and those who 12 asked him about the parable. So here's these guys are coming, they're going to question this. You know, sometimes Jesus will make a statement, if you have ears to hear, hear. And you go, I'm not quite sure I get it. Do you not believe that he knew these guys didn't get it? Of course he knew they didn't get it. And yet he said at the same time, this is very important. If you've got ears to hear, listen, behold, look and see what's going on. If this is so basic and so fundamental, if you don't get this, you'll never have anything. And the ones that get it produce, the ones that don't get it don't produce. In verse number 10, he makes this statement. They come and they ask him about the parable. Verse number 11, and he says to them, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. To you, now let's just stop there just for a moment. I believe that's for every person in this room tonight. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that you're here tonight because you're different. You could have been anywhere. You could have been in a restaurant. You could have been in a movie theater. You could have been in a shopping center. You could have been looking for a new car. You could have been shopping. You could have been, uh, you know, out getting an ice cream. You could have been taking the night out. You could have been sitting at home reading a newspaper. You could have been sitting at home watching television. You could have been anywhere. But tonight you're here. And when he makes this statement, he says to them, you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. I really believe that means you and I. Us that are going after God, us that want God, us that are following. He's talking to who? The disciples. He's talking to who? Those people that are following him. So you're a follower of Jesus. You're a disciple of Jesus. When he made that statement, he's not just talking to them. He's talking to you and I. We have an understanding now that we have been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, wait a minute. If I can figure out the mystery of the kingdom of God, maybe I can get out of where I'm at and get to where I need to be. 
And he says, listen to this, not just to them, but to every single one of us that are sitting in here. He says, but to those who are outside. Wait a minute. Let's put it in terms so we can understand. Those that aren't here. Those that don't care to be here. You know, there's more people don't want to be here tonight than you that are here tonight. There's more people in this church that don't want to be here tonight than those that are, want to be here tonight. And he says these words, but to those who are on the outside, all things come in parables. In other words, they're like mysteries. They're like stories that, that have a statement to say, but you've got to kind of like figure it out and maybe not know exactly how it works. Verse number 12. So that, speaking of the parable, seeing that they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear and not understand. Now he makes a statement that's absolutely bizarre. The ones that are on the outside will see because they're not, they're not ready with God. They're not following after God. They're not the ones that are the disciples. They're not the ones that it has been decided that they should know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They're just the ones that are on the outside. You know, that's like the worldly people that are out there that really don't give a flip about God. And he makes this statement. He says, seeing that, seeing that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear and not understand. Because if they did, least they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. In other words, if you can understand and you can see and you can hear, then all of a sudden you're going to make some changes and you're going to get blessed. Not just salvation, but blessed in every area. Verse 13 comes along as in he says to them, do you not understand the parable? Of course, they didn't understand it any more really than you do, even though you've read it a number of times. He says, don't you understand the parable? He knows they don't, or they wouldn't have questioned him about it. So now he's going to explain the parable, and when he explains the parable, he takes out the stops of misunderstanding. And he takes everything out, makes it clear and easy and precise to understand for this simple reason. Why? Because if you understand this, you're going to produce in your life, instead of being a crabby old person complaining when you're old, having deep issues, you're going to be free and you're going to be producing the things of God. Instead of being down and out, you're going to be an overcomer. Instead of being a loser, you're going to be a winner. Instead of being somebody who's sick, you're going to be healed. Instead of somebody who's broke, down, busted, and disgusted, you're going to be someone that's up giving and be a prosperous and successful person. In every area of your life, instead of your family failing, your family will be successful. Instead of your children failing, your children will be successful. Instead of your marriage failing, your marriage will be successful. Everything. Can I just make one statement right here before I get into this? After 40 years of evaluating the body of Christ, not only the word of the Lord, not only have I evaluated the word of God, have I evaluated the character, nature, and attributes of God to associate that with the word of God, but I've also evaluated by watching people. How come some people are successful and some people are not successful? And you know them. How come some people just have everything? I mean, you talk to them, their cars are nice, their kids are nice, their family's nice, their home's nice, their marriage is nice, they've been, they've been married for 40 years, they're holding hands like newlyweds. What's that all about? Everything just seems to work in their life. And you meet some other people that go to church regularly, even tithe, and they're miserable, down, out, unsuccessful, don't make it. And the answer to this is found in this parable. So when he says, do you not know this parable? Because he's going to come along and make this statement. If you don't understand this parable, you don't understand anything. You won't understand a thing. You'll just keep doing life, keep going to church, keep giving your money, keep making screwball statements, keep living in your own world and wonder why you're failed at the end of your life and you become a sourpuss Christian instead of a witness for Jesus Christ. And some church will house you and comfort you in your misery. 
Because the churches in America are filled with that. Instead of someone saying it like it is. Are you listening? Are you sure you want to listen? Verse 13, and he said to them, do you not understand the parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, this is the basics. If you can't get this, my friends that are in this room, listen to me. If you don't get this, you won't get anything. And you will live, die, and you will go to heaven. But during your time on earth, life will stink for you. It is worth hearing what Jesus has to say. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Is the question. He goes on and he makes this statement, verse number 14. Now he starts to explain the parable, which is really fascinating. He says, here's what the parable is really saying. He says, the sower sows the word. So you see that the sower who sows the seed, back before that we read, really is, here's the translation, the sower sows the true seed. We don't understand what that means because we don't live in that kind of a, a, a society or a social system where we're farmers. But a sower is someone who takes a seed and puts it in the ground. And when he puts it in the ground, there's a harvest coming back from the seed. And that's what a sower does. In those days, you would see somebody with a little like knapsack over his shoulder, a purse inside would be filled with seeds, and he would go an inch or two at a time actually sowing a seed. And now he makes a statement, the sower sows the seed. When he made that statement, what he's really saying is there's someone out there called the Holy Spirit that is sowing the word of God inside of you. Now here's the thing. What you do with the seed determines what your future is going to be like. Mm, let me say it again. What you do with the seed determines what your future is going to be like. One more time. What you do with the seed is going to determine what your future is going to be like. Your future is not based on you. It's based on what you do with the seed. Now, a lot of times we don't understand that because what we see all the time is the sower sows the seed and then we need to be people who receive the seed. Can I just say this to you? If you had a garden and you planted a seed and you didn't water it, you didn't take care of it, you didn't provide it, you didn't protect it, all of a sudden you find the seed would just die and it wouldn't produce anything. If it does produce anything, it wouldn't produce any fruit. And that's the problem. A lot of people is this everybody's going to get the seed, but what you do with the seed is going to determine what your outcome in your future is like. So he goes on and he makes the statement. If I may, may I continue and show you this? Very important for you to see. So or so is the word. And now he starts to explain. There's four types of condition that this word is sown in. Four conditions of the human heart. Because the ground is the heart. And there are four conditions that he describes. It's almost like 25% of the people will have this problem. 25% will have this problem. Another 25% will have this problem. And there's 25% that won't have a problem. <laughs> it's almost like that. But I can assure you tonight, as you look at the word of the Lord, let's identify what we're talking about, what the problems are. So it's, I want you to understand something. I want you to know something. Doesn't matter. Don't hope to be the 25% that doesn't have the problem. There will be trials, tribulations, evil temptations, and pressures that come to your life. There will be situations and pressures all throughout your life. And you're going to have to deal with them because you have the seed of God on the inside of you. How you deal with these things are going to determine your future. That's what he's describing here. So let's take a look. Verse number 14 or 15. And these are the ones that by the wayside when the word is sown 
When they hear, notice this, and you ought to understand this. When they hear, when they hear, they hear it. The seed, they got the seed. Do you know there's a level playing field for every single one of us? It's not about you not getting what you need from God. God's going to give you what you need. It's what you do with what you get. And that's where the failure comes in. So watch this. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word away, which is sown in their hearts. Now he's describing something. Then he goes on in verse number 16 and he makes this statement. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. In other words, here's the second illustration in this parable. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word, they hear it too. Immediately receive it with gladness. Man, have you ever seen anybody say, wow, I got it, it's good, it's great, it's wonderful. Did they get it? Yes. Did they hear it? Yes. Did they, was it received by them? Yes. Were they excited about it? Yes. Did they, here's the question, did they get it? Yes. Everything they needed, they were getting. And they, and they received it with gladness. But verse 17 comes and describes their condition. And when they had no root in themselves, and so endured for only a, a time afterwards, when tribulations and persecution arrived for the word's sake, Immediately they stumbled. The second people came along. They received it. But guess what happened? The first one did something. They, Satan came and just robbed it. The second one, the, the problems came. Pressures came. And because they, they weren't grounded in on the word, it wasn't the fact that they didn't get the word. They got the word. The word was there for them, but they, they didn't get into the word. They didn't per- see the word as something important. And, and they didn't get into it. So when the precious persecution came for the word's sake, immediately they stumbled. Verse number 18. Now these are the ones sown among the thorns. So here's the third group, also sown. The word of God is sown in those people who are really into something. Now here's what they're sown among the thorns. They are the ones that hear the word. They got it, third people, third category people. They also got the word. See, every single one of us in here have the ability to get a hold of the word. It's what you do with it. That's the case. And he makes this statement in verse 18. Uh, He says, they hear the word. Verse number 19, go please. Verse 19, and the cares of the world, deceitful lusts of riches, a desire of other things, entertaining, choke the word and becomes unfruitful. In other words, all the stuff in the world, is it not important for you to have the stuff? Sure it is. But the stuff can't have you. Nor can it get you away from the importance of what the seed is. In the seed is your blessed future. In the seed is your blessed future. It is not the deceitful lust of the world. It is not, if you will, uh, the desires of other things more important. And here's where a lot of Christians come in. They let persecution rob them the seed out of the ground. They let trials, tribulations rob the seed out of the ground. They, They let desires for other things rob the seed out of their heart. They, 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 they have, uh, if you will, deceitful riches. This is riches deceitful can be if you allow it to. It can get you off track if you let it. doesn't mean that God doesn't want to bless you. God wants to bless you. He wants you to handle the blessing, not the blessings handling you. When the blessings handle you, all of a sudden now you're in a position of being deceitful. And so we find ourselves in a place. And what happens to all of these people? Here's all three categories of people. They also become unfruitful. But then it comes along, verse number 20, and listen to what it says. But those are the ones who are sowing on good ground. Good ground. All of a sudden, they've got a good heart. Those are the, hear the word. They also got the word too. Accepted it. Bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So all of a sudden, there's four categories of types of people. There's the one that hears it and, you know, he's got no depth to it and he loses it because he really didn't see something important about it. And there's the ones that are letting the cares of the world and the pressures come in and take it away. There's those people that come along and there's a, they got their interest on anything else but God. Their you know, job is more important. Their kids are more important. The soccer game on Saturday is more important. The soccer game on Sunday is more important. Uh, meeting the needs of all of my neighbors, living up to what everybody else does instead of the things of God rob the seed from them and all of a sudden they produce nothing and then the fourth category is someone who received the seed in good ground 
Can I just say something? There's probably a person, if you will, that probably doesn't have a whole lot of problems. There's a lot of people that just get blessed because of where they're at. And we keep our eyes on those 25% of the people when we're part of the 75% of the people that need to watch ourselves. I don't know about you, but I need the word of God. I need to have somebody tell me all the time. I need somebody to get in my face and make sure I'm going on with God. Are you following me? Because I don't want to fall into the category of falling away and not having my seed produce anything. So I'm really conscious about this. I could say to you, well, I'm different than everybody else. I've got a good heart. I've received the seed. I've got fruit in my life. I don't need to do this. But I want you to know something. I'm smart enough to realize that I need to do everything that number one, number two, and number three didn't do. I need to make sure I am doing it. But can I just share this with you? Because I want to take you past these verses and quickly look at some things before we close tonight. And I'm, I'm already out of time. What's interesting about this, he says in verse, if you will, he says in verse number 21, also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under the bed? It is not to be set on, uh, uh, is it not to be set on a lampstand? In other words, he said, here you are, you're producing. You need to be a witness. In other words, you're not something that's put under the bed. You're not just something that's hidden. You're a lampstand for God. You're going to produce something. God wants to bless you so the world that doesn't know God sees that the blessings don't come from their own activities but come from God. And then he makes a statement. He comes along to his disciples and he says this, verse 22. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that should come to light. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, man, he's really saying this over and over again. This is really important for you and I to realize how important to get the word and do the word. Because it's getting the word you're going to get. Now, what are you going to do with it when you get it? But I found the fascinating ones is verse 24 and 25. Listen to what Jesus says in in, uh, Mark, the fourth chapter, verse number 24. In verse number 25, and he said to them, take heed. What you hear with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured to you. And that you who hear more will be given. In other words, if I hear the seed, so it sows the seed, and I understand it, and I get this, all of a sudden, the more I have, the more is given to me. He's talking about multiplication of blessings, all because when you got a little, you did a lot with it. Verse 25, watch this. And he says, for whoever has, to him more will be given. Wait a minute. In other words, what I do with the seed determines my future. But not only what determines my future is the more I have of the seed the more of a witness I will be, and the more I have, the more will be given unto me. And you want it, and you know it. Even what he has, he will be taken away. Does not, those who have not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, the three quarters don't produce anything, but one quarter did because of good soil. But the problem wasn't with the three quarters. The three quarter people, those three quarter of people who didn't do what they should have been doing with the seed were people simply like all of us that did not do the right thing with what was sown in our heart. And therefore, he doesn't bless us back more. Now, let me share this with you. Quickly, four things God gave me as a responsibility of the receiver. We're all receivers. We all want to be blessed. We all have the ability to get the word of God. The Holy Spirit is the sower. He will put the word of God in your heart if you really want it. If you don't really want it, you ain't going to get it. Sorry about the bad language. Number one, responsibilities of a receiver. Number one, you got to hear it. So many times we come into the house of God and people do not hear. 
I can't tell you how many times I've sit in this platform over the years of 40 years of ministering the word of God and finding people sitting there staring at me with their mouth wide open as they're asleep inside of the sanctuary, hoping that God's gonna drop some dew drops on them and they're going to get blessed. They don't know how close they come to me running down the aisle and putting my fist in their left eye. That's the dew drop they're gonna get. And it's not because I don't love them like crazy. I really care about them and love them. I just break on the inside. I'm so hurting on the inside. I can see the future for them. They're going to become part of the three quarters and they're going to be destroyed and they're never going to produce anything and they're going to be unhappy when they could have been blessed. And if we don't hear, like tonight, if I just, you know, that's why preachers like me go through all five kinds of things voice changes and walk and talk and all kinds of comments and, you know, ups and downs and uh, uh, intensities because I'm trying like crazy to keep the attention of the people so they'll just hear, so they'll just get blessed. That's what I do. I don't sit here just go, mm, I'm the robot. I care enough about you to put some passion into this to keep you awake so that you will hear the word of God. My goodness sakes. Proverbs, the 18th chapter, verse 15. Let me put it up on the overhead. Listen to what it says. Because we can come into the house of God and we can hear some noise, walk out of here and never hear anything. Not even know. Let me give you an illustration. Do you remember last week's message? There it is, right there, proof. <laughs> instead of thinking about it, instead of meditating it, you got to make sure you hear it, not to just hear it for a moment. You don't hear with your ears. You hear with your heart. When it goes from your ears and drops into residency in your heart, now you have heard it. When it becomes part of your makeup, your nature, now you have heard it. I often use the story that my father taught me how to tie my shoes. He'd go like this, like this, and I finally learned how to do it. I'd go over and hold it and go over and hold it and hold it. And then finally, when I was a little boy, I finally, we had, we had shoelaces in those days. It's an amazing invention. And uh, uh, so we had shoelaces. And to this day, even though I don't have any shoes, I don't think that I've even shoelaced. Maybe I do. But you, but, you know, you go around, you do this, you hold it there, and you pull it through. You know, I, I can talk and think and, and express stuff and not even be looking and tie my shoes. Why? Because it became part of my character. Now I have heard my father teach me how to tie my shoes. It wasn't just something I heard in my ears. It became part of my life. So when God makes a statement that you got to hear, he's talking about hearing enough where what you hear becomes part of your life. This is not just going to church and attendance because a lot of people go to church and attendance that are broke down, busted, and disgusted. This is about hearing with your heart that it becomes so deep on the inside of you that it changes your life. Is anybody listening? <laughs> Proverbs 18, 15 says, the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge. And I'm not talking about knowledge of the world, talking about knowledge of the things of God. And the ear of the wise seeks that knowledge. Very important for us to hear with our heart so we hear to the place where it becomes part of our life. Has your mom and dad ever taught you something where it became the way you do things? Debbie has a way of doing things. She hangs up towels a certain way. She folds towels a certain way. And I fold towels like hand towels or dish towels or any kind of towel differently than her. And she says, no, that's not the way to do it. This is the way to do it. I said, where'd you learn that? My mom told me. We make a bed together. She makes the bed. She brings the sheets and the and the, and the blanket all the way to the top up by the pillows. I don't do that. I fold it down a little bit so that I'm a tall person. I, want, I don't want that blanket around my head. I want it down here by my neck. But her mom taught her how to do that. Became part of her. 
I cannot get her out of not putting the blanket on that way. I just let it happen when she's not looking, I put it back down. It's the way it is. The toilet paper has got to go from the back side up. It cannot go from over the top to the front. How'd you learn that? It's always been that way in my house. She heard how the toilet, ah, when she's not looking, I put it the other way around. <laughs> See, all of our lives, there's things we hear that really are part of us. And when the Word of God becomes part of you, that's the difference between just going to church and being in the church. Second thing, real quick, responsibilities of a receiver is not only to hear it, but to understand it. I have got to make sure, clearly understand. If there's somebody in the pulpit preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's favor is on them and God has anointed them, whether you like them or not, whether you like their personality, like the way they look, like the way they talk, like whatever, maybe you don't like this, don't like that, get past all of that. Get into what is being said because God has put a stamp of approval on it and God has a messenger. And tonight, I'm delivering a message to you and you got to understand. If you don't understand it, it'd be well worth you going over and over and over and over until you get it. Because he says, let those that have ears to hear, what? Hear. And understanding is something vitally important. So many times we'll hear a message, not understand the depth of the message. Just take it for granted, walk out. When that was a life-changing expression that you're going to need a week from now when the devil attacks you and your family, your children, finance, dream, vision, destiny, and purpose. My goodness sakes, you're going to need to have what was said, but you didn't understand it. You never had to be able to do it. And what happens? All of a sudden, the pressures of the world come, and you get off the word and the seed that was planted inside of you because you heard it, but you didn't understand it. Therefore, you can't do anything about it. Is anybody listening? I love the word of God because it makes it very clear. In 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica in verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, when you receive the word, listen to this, when you receive the, listen to this, when you receive the, one, one more time, when you received the word of God, they received it, listen to this, which you heard from us. You welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. What a powerful verse. That's an amazing, amazing verse. You gotta hear it. You gotta work at making yourself understand it. You don't come to church to put in time. You come to church to get that cultivated seed to produce life in your future. Are you listening to me? And that takes time to hear, if you will, and understand. Third thing is you gotta protect it. Here comes the devourers. Here comes the cares of the world. Here comes the pressures, the trials, the tribulation. Here, like me for an example, here comes times for months I've been praying and believing God and I've gotten worse. During these times, I have got to protect what I know is truth, the word, and ignore what I know is speaking, the pain. I have got to get out of it. If I don't protect, it won't be long before when you don't get prayers answered, after a while you go, oh my goodness, maybe God's mad at me. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God doesn't listen. Maybe, I, maybe this is all stupid. Maybe this is foolishness. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it, it, you've got to protect the word of God because there's times coming of pressure and trials. There's times coming of temptations. There's times coming when you will wonder where in the world God is. It's part of the development of your character. God will let you go through these times to see whether or not you can handle true tough times. It'll help build you stronger and make you a greater person in this whole thing. And during those times, you better be protecting the word of God. It may not be working this moment with you, but it's working for you in the future and it will come to pass. I told someone today, I think it was my, maybe Richard or, or somebody, I'm not sure who I talked to, they were talking to me about healing. I said, my healing is already here. 
It just hasn't manifested here. It's in my heart. It just isn't in my butt. You see, that's just the way it is. You got to protect it because there's times when you will not see instantaneous results and you got to stay in there with God. How many people do you know when tough times come, they're gone? Must not work. I like this, 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 16. Take heed. That's interesting. All through the scripture. Take heed, he says, take heed to yourself and to the teaching. That's what the word doctrine means. Continue in them. Continue in them. I should have underlined the words, continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Listen, nobody looks for anybody who backs off. You got to keep on going. We're not those people who back off. We're the people who keep on going. The word, I may not see the results of it today, but I will have it tomorrow, I guarantee you. Come on, somebody. We're talking about responsibilities of the receiver, last one for tonight. You got to give it. What you give away you gain more of. You saw that earlier. So as I receive from God, the word of God, I got to give it out. You know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So therefore, as I speak it out to somebody, I get it back. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake it together, running over shall men. Not just about money. Have you ever thought about it in other terms besides money? Shall men give unto your bosom? Guess what? It's not just about money. It's about when you give, you become now the receptacle of God's gifts back to you. And so all of a sudden, that which I got from God, I take in and I use it. But when I give it away, guess what happens? I get more back. Four things tonight to take a look at. In fact, let's just take a look at the last verse on that one. If you will, Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse number 7 and verse number 8. As you go preach, he's talking to his disciples. First missionary effort in the Bible. He's sending his disciples out. He makes this statement. Jesus says, go preach, say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now watch this, verse number eight. Then he tells them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Oh, come on, where's American churches doing that? We start doing that, we would start seeing some results in American churches besides institutions gathering together because he's looking for the 30, the 60, and the 100 full return. God wants to bless you. Four things. Number one, you gotta hear it. Number two, you gotta understand it. Number three, you're gonna have to protect it. And number four, you're gonna have to give it. Now, what you do with the seed is gonna determine your future. And here's the truth, it's your call. You can sit and do nothing and get nothing. My Bible says that what you sow, you, what you sow, you, what you sow, you, you sow nothing, you reap nothing. So tonight, the difference between some people successful and some people that are failures that are Christians is what they've done with the seed. And it's your call as to what you do. We just try to motivate you to do it, see it, hear it, understand it, give it away, be part of your life so that you will be blessed. But we can't get everybody blessed because they don't want to hear it understand it, protect it, and give it. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you hear that? I'm going to let you go in a minute, but before we do, we always like to make sure everybody's right with God here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center before you go. What that means is you do not go to heaven because you came to church tonight. Listen to me. You do not go to heaven because you're a nice person or a good person. You do not go to heaven because you call yourself a Christian, wear a cross, have a St. Christopher around your neck. You do not go to heaven. You, you won't make it 
because you know who Jesus is. Even the devil knows who Jesus is. Come on. You know that. He's not going to heaven. Head knowledge about who Jesus is, celebrating Christmas and celebrating Easter, listen to what I'm going to say to you. Listen, listen, listen. Will not get you into heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way but his way. And he tells us exactly and exclusively what it is that you have to do in order to get in heaven. And found in John 3rd chapter. He said these words, you must be born again. What in the world does that mean? The words born again turn everybody off in American churches. You know why? Because Hollywood has portrayed people that are born again as idiots, radicals and fanaticals. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Listen, 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 listen. Remember how it is important that you hear and understand? I'm explaining it clearly for you right now. Here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means you have given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Did you know you need to give it to him? He won't steal it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to make you do this. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. Oh, come on. Do you mean to tell me that God couldn't, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who speaks in plants and solar systems, go into place? You mean to tell me he couldn't make a billion robots that look exactly like you, that could worship him, praise him, sing songs to him? He doesn't. He makes you and gives you a free will choice to give God all of your heart or give God all of your life or not to do it. It's your call, your choice. That's what this is all about. You don't go to heaven because God says you're going to go and you're not. You go to heaven because you make the call as a free will choice. You went to the cross, died for everybody. That's what the Bible says. So that you can make the choice to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. And if you haven't done it, you're not saved. Somebody needs to love you enough respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven. You're going to be shocked when you find out you're not going to make it. But somebody needs to tell you the truth. You must be born again. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's what he said. Oh my goodness. What did he just really say? I will vomit you from my mouth if you're lukewarm. I'll vomit you from my mouth, is what Jesus said. In other words, lukewarm, little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. Tonight is your night of salvation. To give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You heard the word, you understand the word, you're going to have to protect this now, and you're going to have to go on with the things of God so that you can produce in life. And it starts with you giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Now, I've told you the truth. Tonight is your night of salvation. Will you give Him all of your heart tonight in this safe, friendly place? Will you make the commitment and give him all of your life in this safe, friendly place? If you can't do it in a safe, friendly place here, how will you ever live for him out there? Man, that's a vicious, mean world that wants to make a mockery of your Lord and Savior, Jesus. Put you down for your faith. At least start here by making a confession of your faith and giving him all of your heart and all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So I'm going to count to three and go like this. One, two, three. I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, I'll see your hand, you put it right back down. It's as simple as that. And tonight, here we are, approaching Christmas 2014, is your night of salvation. Sit there and do nothing. Remember, there are four types of people. Three of them did nothing with what they heard. Only one did something. Now tonight, do what's right. 
and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Pop my hands together. You let me see your hand and you say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you're afraid of what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that stupid. Tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. Tonight is your night. Ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Thank you back here. Anybody else? There's 13. God bless you. There's 13 already. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else needs to get their hand up? There's 13 wise people. Given Jesus all of your heart. Thank you. I think that's, I may have counted it or not. I'm not sure, but I'm going to count it because I love numbers. That's 14. Go ahead. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 14 wise people. Now, here's what I want you to do. All 14 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. I want you to get out of your seat and get your stuff. Now, listen to me. I want you to do this. You're serious about God then let's get serious about doing it God's way. If he can walk Calvary for you, beaten bloody mess for you, a public spectacle for you, then you can walk a safe aisle for him. So I don't want you to mess with me now. I want you to get out of your seat, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God, I want all going to stand and welcome you. I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me right here in front. All 14 of you and anybody that should have, you come right now. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong. Come on, give him a hand, they're coming. For the reason that I live, for the reason that I need, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong. Come on, give them a hand as they come. Pretty exciting. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, all of you in front, thank God you've come. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Going to go to heaven, not hell. So that ought to make you happy. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel wants to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus in your heart. You need to invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now he's a gentleman. He needs to be invited in. It's your heart and your life, and he's not going to steal it from you. He's going to be invited in by you. He'll lead you in a prayer. Second thing, he's going to give you some free information, free stuff. We love free around here at The Rock. Take it home, read about it. In fact, some of the stuff that I just ministered tonight will be in that little booklet that you're going to get. I wrote the booklet, Third Grade Reading Level. How do I know? Because I'm a third grade reader. And guess what? So he said, oh, you are? Yeah, sure, why not? I can read third, fourth, fifth, maybe sixth. And so anyway, um, third grade reading level. Third thing he's going to do, introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Only takes a few moments. People who came up, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.